This is WPSL Port St. Lucie. Friends, it's America's Reset. The opinions on this program are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WPSL. WPSL does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WPSL. Legal questions? Ask a lawyer. Give us a call at 340-1590. 340-1590 here at the studios of WPSL. And Ask a Lawyer with your host, Attorney Stuart M. Address. Good morning, Treasure Coast and everywhere else. How are you? Hope you all had a good week. Looking forward to the weekend. I know I hope it's going to be a little bit warmer, but not too warm. I'm going to be out at the Mets game on Sunday, and so I don't want to roast, but... It would be nice if it was moderately warm. Well, yeah, sunny at the ball game would be nice, right? <laughs> and tomorrow I'll be indoors all day with another speech tournament. So it could be as hot as it wants. It, well, no, no. I have to walk from round to round. So please don't be hot. Well, be cool. You know this stretch of cool is going to end yeah, quickly. <laughs> it's not cool enough for me to have to put on the heat, but it's still nice. Yeah. All right. So, you know, tomorrow I mentioned... Um, the Lincoln Park Academy folks, the speech and debate team that I am coaching, uh, we go tomorrow to uh, the qualifying tournament for the national championships. Awesome. Um, and it'll be very, very good experience for these first-year uh, competitors uh, to see what it's like when people are fighting for so spots. So all of them on the team get a chance to qualify? Well, they get a chance. Right. Well, it's up to them to they qualify, right? They probably won't. <laughs> Let's be honest. I've told them the same thing. You know, I've told them, get the experience. Let this tournament be the springboard to next mm-hmm, month mm-hmm. where we have the Novice State Championships. And as difficult as even that may be in a state this size, we have a couple <coughs> of our kids that are really, really, really great in their pieces. And I don't know, th- th- somebody might slip in and surprise us and... Uh, bring back something, and uh, that would be one half of an accomplishment for that student and something great for LPA and for me as a coach. Especially being the inaugural year Especially. of speech and debate. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of the inaugural year at LPA of speech and debate, uh, the, the principal at LPA, Mr. Santa Bria, um, although it took three years to get this team, I've also been lobbying him all year for a speech and debate class, Mm -hmm. an elective, because they have those classes in Palm Beach County, in Broward County. And so the students that are on the speech and debate team, they get to work on their projects, their programs during the school day, not just for an hour or two here Mm -hmm. or there after school. And then anybody else who wants to take it as an elective takes it, and it's It's very valuable. I've talked about that before. Well, he told me earlier this year that he was going to try. You're never quite sure what that really Mm -hmm, means. mm -hmm. If they could find the space, if they could find the budget, if they can figure out how to make the schedule work. Well, yesterday I was emailed the elective list that was passed out to 11th graders who get them first since they'll be seniors. And there under communications was debate one. Awesome. And I've got to tell you folks, I got a frog in my throat when I saw that. Um, A tear almost came down. Now, how does it work at the school? Now, does it matter how many students sign up? Yes. Okay. There's probably only so many they can accept unless they go to two periods. Well, you're going to expect everybody from the team to sign up, right? Oh, yes. You better believe it. Yeah. Better believe it. Uh, obviously, I'm not. I'm not teaching it because right. I'm, I'm not a teacher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the the English teacher, my son's English teacher, who is the coach, um, as because she's faculty, uh, and you know, admittedly, this year had mentioned she really knew nothing about speech and debate, uh, but took it on because she believed in the concept of public speaking, and is now very much learning. A lot about speech, a little about debate, because we haven't really gotten into that yet this year. That'll be next year. Uh, she is gung-ho to teach speech and debate. 
gung ho to do what she sees is being done in Broward and Palm Beach County. Have a class, you know, where you have a regular curriculum. You know, everybody has to learn certain types of things, but that the students who want to be on the team or who are on the team, if they need work on their prose or their informative speech or, you know, researching their debate topic, they now have extra time to do that. And that is what increases the ability to be competitive. Um, the schools at all these tournaments that walk away with 10, 15, 20, 25 trophies that have teams of 50 kids. These are the schools that have classes that teach it, you know, in, mm -hmm. in high school and in middle school, in Broward, in elementary school. Uh, these are the kids that when they start their first year in high school, they are novices <laughs> in name only. They've often been competing for three years for middle school and obviously they are going to be much better and so we would like to expand next year or maybe the year after into allowing the middle school students at Lincoln Park to also uh, join the speech and debate team but we couldn't do that this year because we had no, no idea how many people would be interested and truthfully in your first year there's only so many you can handle and, and, and be effective. We have a good group of just under 10 kids and that's the perfect number um, for the coach and, and I to to really work with and, and see blossom and, and grow and it, not just in their programs but in self-confidence and self-esteem it's it's truly been wonderful so um, if you are listening and you have a kid at Lincoln Park Academy or if you have a friend who has a kid at Lincoln Park Academy let them know that next year there's speech and debate as an elective, and it, it counts as a graduation credit, I believe, in the art for the arts. Um, it's a great program. It's a great class. And even if you don't want to be on the team, um, just learning how to get up and speak to people uh, is such a such an invaluable uh, learning skill. So, what are we going to do today? I figured we would sort of continue along the line of, you know, the d various topic areas where we get lots of calls in the office, um, which may spark some, some calls here. But once again, any calls are welcome. Whatever you want to ask. It's 340-1590. Uh, you know, it's easy to dial. You push the button. You know, I was watching this video about the rotary phones. Folks, it is so much easier to call us now. 340-1590 should take you about a second and a half to dial. If you had a rotary phone, you know, it might take you 20 seconds. We, I, should, you know. we should be in their favorites anyway, don't you think? <laughs> we sh yes, absolutely. Yes. You yes. should put us in your favorites. Mm -hmm. Oh, my, my mother's watching. You know, my, my mom, say yes if they can hear me, and I'll, I'll do my little shout-out. Uh, but until I see you say the jackhammer is gone, I'm, I'm not talking about them. So... <laughs> We get calls on whistleblowers. We talked about whistleblowers one week. And we get calls from people who say, well, I've been fired uh, because I complained about this, that, or the other thing. Or I've not been fired, but I think they're beginning to you know, try to set me up mm -hmm. to get me out. And if you are a whistleblower, you have protection under the Florida Whistleblower Act. If you've been fired, well, you know, you don't have the protection for your job, but you certainly have a right to sue for damages. And maybe even reinstatement if you want it. Um, and some people do, yeah. depending upon the job. What's funny is that the term, there's no going back, went through my brain right when you said reinstatement that. Reinstatement goes back. <laughs> yeah, there's no going back. You know, back. with back benefits and back everything, <laughs> yeah. back, oh. you know, if, if there's a, you know, retirement plan or, you know, a pension, you know, back accrued time. Mm -hmm. All that stuff can be given See, and it back all depends, you. too, on what you are fighting for. I yes. mean, if you had a lot of perks like that that were coming to you that you yes. may have lost, yeah. Now, so, you know, really, what is, what is protected? There are three subsections to the Florida Whistleblower Act. Uh, the first is if you have actually testified before a state agency um, or a federal agency or you know, given testimony about violations of law. So you've already blown the whistle. You've already blown the whistle. 
you now have protection. But I'm going to divert from two and three folks. Uh, please forgive me. There is somebody who is watching, um, who is in Florida, being, I guess, a snowbird, uh, is having a, a meal with my, my sister and my mother, who I haven't talked to probably in about, oh, 35 years. Um, so and they're that, catching you on Facebook. They're, they're watching okay. me live mm -hmm. on Facebook. So Norman. Hello, Norman. Norman was um, my next-door neighbor when I grew up in New Jersey, uh, starting when I was about nine years old. And I forget when it was, 12, 13. Uh, I broke my shoulder, and I had one of these casts that had a metal bar coming down from my left arm to my chest. Did you, was so your I arm, looked, like, sticking yes, out to the side? It was okay. sticking out. Mm -hmm. and I looked like uh, there was a good program <laughs> on it at that time. You know, I looked like the Munsters. <laughs> you know, I had to sleep with my arm hanging down the side of the bed. How'd you break it? <laughs> I, I fell legally, or what we told, what we said in court. <laughs> I, I fell. Well, only I, tell what you can. I, I fell on ice cream. Uh, no, that's actually not. <laughs> that's the story. I'm sorry. I get confused. You know, I fell on ice cream uh, on a step in a New York apartment building visiting friends. Okay, the statute of limitations has passed. Um, we were playing, <laughs> okay. and I slipped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how I broke it. And then when I, we, the doctor in New York said it, we got to New Jersey where we lived, and the doctor there didn't like the way it was set and said, we're breaking it again. Oh, gosh. And he was going to do it while I was awake. I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're putting me out. They did. Wow. But anyway, so Norman <laughs> figuring, you know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of downtime. Sure. And all I had read to that date were, you know, comic books for fun. Um, no real books. Well, you're a kid, right? Right. Okay. So Norman bought, bought me my first Hardy Boys book. And I think I finished it in an afternoon. And so from then on, my parents... <laughs> well, that kept you entertained for a day, yes. right? <laughs> so my parents had to buy me three or four mm -hmm. Hardy Boys books at a time. Okay. You know, like every yeah. weekend. Yeah, because you were going to be tied tie up for a while. Yes, absolutely. And I would come <laughs> home. I, I, I would read a, a book from, you know, cover to cover. You know, finish it that same day. Uh, and over time, I did accumulate the entire Hardy's Boys collection. I think at that time it was 40 or 50 books. Uh, and I read them two times. And so what Norman likes to say, or I don't know, he, maybe he hasn't said it for 30 years. So who <laughs> knows? What he, what he liked to say was, he set me on the path to being a lawyer. All right, Norman, I won't quibble. I'll give you some credit. You, you got me into reading. Reading is fundamental. Uh, you know, reading led me to read other things. And so, yes, you did have some role in uh, pushing me towards uh, higher education. So thank you. So it's a good thing you broke your shoulder that, that I You know, that I year. guess it was propitious. <laughs> That's a, that may be an SAT word, propitious. Uh, I guess it was propitious that I broke my shoulder. Uh, you know, they say things happen. And I started to read. And that was a, uh, an excellent skill to learn, uh, just as typing class was in high school mm. when I was the only boy in the class. <laughs> but, you know, it's very helpful right now. Um, so, okay, go back to eating, folks. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, Norman, if you feel like calling the show, you know, and, and, and telling your side of the story, you know, it's 340-1590, 772-340-1590. I know you have something called a cell phone. You know, hey, give a call. For all I know, I won't even recognize your voice. Call yourself something else like Bill. And by the way, say hi to Judy. <laughs> That's his wife. They were our next-door neighbors for, oh, goodness gracious, 20 years, maybe more. I don't remember. Um, but it's awesome that, that they're visiting now. They're I mean, visiting, all those, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. this time. All this time later. Mm -hmm. All right, so going back to whistleblower. The, the second thing is if you threaten to testify, I'm going to report you. Okay. I don't know how that could be good in a work situation. Well, the third one is if you just are asked to do something and you refuse to participate, uh, you are also protected. Now, we usually see the third category. They know of something that's wrong. Mm -hmm. They say it's wrong. They don't want to be wanna involved be in it. it. Okay. And they're and fired. Now, and now you're out. Okay. okay. That is what the Whistleblower Act is all about. Um, I think there were lots of whistleblowers in uh, 
recently testifying before Congress. Now, they have a federal whistleblower act. That's not the Florida one, but uh, we deal with the Florida one for the most part. Anyway, we do have a call. We have John on line one. Hello, John. How can I help you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question for you. A close friend of mine is on the board of directors for a nonprofit organization, and they're dealing with the IRS. And he tells me they can buy insurance that would pre protect the board direct the board of directors from any kind of uh, involvement. Well, in not um, from any kind. There mm -hmm. is insurance that boards of directors should have. Uh, most corporations that have boards, even small ones, nonprofit ones, right? Uh, you can buy errors and omissions policies. Um. And you can buy policies, I forget what the second policy is called, but that protect the board members when they're exercising their duties faithfully, or if they're wrong, certainly not willfully. Okay. Um, if a board member acts willfully in breach of their fiduciary duty, no insurance is going to protect them. I, I, I guess they're behind uh, in paying taxes for the last couple of years or so. Right. I guess they got extensions, and uh, you know they're dealing with them, but they're yet to resolve it. And uh, some of the board members, I guess, are getting a little nervous and don't want to be around. If uh, oh, I don't blame them. Well, first yeah. of all, you're probably not going to be able to buy the insurance now and have it retroactive. Well, they they they, they haven't been charged with anything okay. yet. That, you know what I'm saying? But there's um, an investigation ongoing. Well, no, that they're, they're supposed supposedly they feel it coming. Pardon me? They feel it coming? Well, it, I think it's probably inevitable if okay. they don't um, pay it and, you know, resolve it to the satisfaction of... Uh, Most of the board members, even without insurance, mm -hmm. would most likely have a defense to personal liability unless they acted in a manner which would allow anybody, including the IRS... Um, to go after them individually. And that usually involves a willful and intentional breach of fiduciary duty. Yeah. Uh, something that is an error, a mistake, uh, even, even negligent, careless. You know, yeah. should have checked into it a little bit better. That usually does not expose a board member to individual liability. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't know what the exact issue with the IRS is, but it would surprise me if there was really a basis for individual liability unless, you know, let's say some board member made a recommendation that we do something, we characterize something in a way that we won't have to pay taxes, knowing that all you were trying to do was evade the taxes, and the rest of the board, understanding what this board member was proposing, uh, voted in favor of it, then I can see yep. liability. I see. But yeah. if somebody does something, you know, I mean, the IRS audits people all the time, corporations all the time. It doesn't mean they get to what's called pierce the corporate veil. Um, one of the fundamental purposes of corporations um, in our society is to protect against individual liability. It, it's a shield. And yeah. there are very clear rules about piercing the corporate veil. Uh, and really it goes down to, for the most part, willful disregard, you know, of, of laws or regulations, things where you know you're doing wrong. Then right. they're going to come after you individually. But, you know, the average board member, let's say these people who sit on, you know, Fortune 100 companies, uh, why sit on that company if you may be exposed to a billion-dollar, you know, debt because of some mistake that was made? Uh, it's risky. Yeah, but you're on that board to make sure that these mistakes don't happen. You are, but nobody well, is perfect. No yeah. board is perfect. Yeah. And and when we're talking, let's say about small boards, you know, here in Florida, for example, my temple, I'm on the board. Yeah. We don't have insurance. We know we should. We can ask a rabbi next hour, <laughs> but we don't right now because it's not as high on the totem pole. That doesn't mean that I and some of the other board members have expressed concern about the protection. But then again, we realize 
the likelihood of being exposed personally to any debt is very small as long as we are carefully evaluating decisions and, and not doing something grossly wrong. Which, which is awesome to have an attorney on the board. <laughs> we try. You try. <laughs> uh, and then they blame me if we screw up. <laughs> but, I mean, I hope that helps. Yeah, it does, absolutely. I, I guess the board um, keeps being reassured by the treasurer or some of the officers that they're dealing with it and it's going to be taken care of. But I guess from month to month, right. there, it doesn't change. There's no good news. No new news. Well, you know, the IRS moves slow except when they want to move fast. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So if somebody's trying to deal with it and, you know, exchange information before there's an actual audit notice or something, I can understand it taking time. Uh, hopefully it's something that gets worked through. But then again, you if know, you it, were on the board at this point, would you no longer be on the board? or would you? Well, no, if, if, if I didn't do anything wrong, if I didn't knowingly do anything wrong, yeah. I, I, would, I would not be worried about staying on the board because yeah. um, I wouldn't see any real avenue to being exposed individually. Uh, in fact, you know, if I cared about the company, whatever it is, you know, a business, uh, a temple, you know, some other type of nonprofit, you know, I might want to stay on the board to help try to guide um, yeah. the resolution of the matter to the benefit yeah. of, of the, the entity that I care about. Right. right. That and that includes sense. homeowners associations. Mm -hmm. You know, they have boards and, you know, those boards are responsible for their decisions. Yeah, and it's your neighborhood. Yeah. You know, and... Again, individual liability is a risk. Um, it's something that there should be insurance because insurance will cover for the negligent acts. Right. right. Okay. If, if they're able, you know, usually it'll cover the entity. But, you know, heavens to bid, you know, it gets to the individual, it should cover you. It's just nothing's going to cover you for a, a willful effort to breach a fiduciary duty, whether it's fraud, you know, whether it's whatever it is. That's, that's never going to be protected against. Well, it all makes sense, and, it, and your input and information is invaluable. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. I uh, hope you enjoy the show, and thank you for calling. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. And, and that's a great example of, you know, a call that we're not on that topic, but doesn't really matter. You know, the topics I pick are sort of just to have something to talk about for mm -hmm. an hour. And, yeah. you know, if you're listening and you have some other issue, well, okay, that's really what I'd really like to hear. But thank you, John, for calling. And so, you know, f sort of finalizing what we're talking about on the whistleblower, if the person is still employed, one of the first things we'll tell them to do is make sure the complaints you made are in writing. Let's not have a he said, she said, because unless you want to pay me hourly, I may not take the case. Let's get it in writing, and then if something happens to you, you know, soon thereafter, you may have a very good whistleblower action, unless, of course, the company has a legitimate reason to terminate you anyway. And, and that's where we get into some very interesting mm -hmm. issues, not just in whistleblower, but in discrimination cases, um, sexual harassment cases, you know, all these types of cases. What happens, you complain, and you're protected under the statute for complaining. Even if you're wrong, you're still protected from retaliation. So what happens if they fire you for something you did six months ago, uh, legitimately wrong, they didn't really care about it six months ago, but they fire you now? Is that retaliation? Probably. Probably. If we could show that that was overlooked, passed by, it was it was now in the past rearview mirror, and now they're going back to it to try to get you uh, because they don't like that you just complained. Yeah, that's retaliation. But now here in Florida, because it's a right to work state, can't it's they? It's not just, a right to work. It's state. not. No, no, no. See, uh, people use that term all the time. But I thought that they could go. You're fired, and we don't have to give you a that's reason. That's called just at will. Go. That's at will. Right to work is really a union term. It, it basically, it, it comes down to, you know, the right to work states and 
it's, it's not employment, it's unionized. And so people, particularly people that are experienced and have family or have been in unions and are familiar with the term, assume, okay, you know, since I have rights in Florida under the union and right to work, this is a right to work state. Well, it, it's not in the employment context. There used to be three states in the country left that were right to work states. I'm not sure any exist anymore. Essentially, everybody in this country is an at-will state. Now, some states have exceptions to the harsh at-will doctrine. We don't. The harsh at-will doctrine is you can be fired for no reason at all or any reason. That reason can be good or bad, fair or unfair, factually correct or incorrect. So they say your, your cash drawer was $10 short. You're fired. They find the $10 that night. You entitled to your job back? No. They were wrong, but if they don't want to give you your job back, you're fired. That's an at-will state. That's the harsh at-will doctrine that doesn't have any protections added onto it. The only thing you're really protected against in that situation are statutes that will give you protection. So, the Florida Civil Rights Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, you know, which discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation for reporting of those things, the Florida Whistleblower Act, um, complaining about workers' compensation, being fired, retaliation. Um, there are a number of areas where you do have rights to be protected, and if you're let go in violation of those, you have legitimate cases. What if a manager fires you because they want to give your salary to their best friend who needs a job? Perfectly okay. Yeah. I, I, I actually, we yeah. get calls about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it, I'm, it's, it's unfair, I, I think, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. perfectly okay. No grounds to stand No there. grounds. Yeah, you're just gone. You know, if, if, if they did it because um, they're trying to turn the company more white, well, now you have a case. Mm -hmm. But just because this is my friend and I'd rather work with my friend mm -hmm. than you, mm -hmm. goodbye. And, you know, there are states that have various other forms of protection added on to that doctrine. There are some states that require cause in almost every other circumstance. So it, it's almost But a now when you state. go to file for your unemployment, don't they ask the cause? Well, they do because they're trying to determine, A, whether you quit or you were really fired. Okay. And also cause matters in unemployment because you're not entitled to unemployment if you engaged in misconduct. Okay. So if you were insubordinate, you're going to be denied unemployment. But that employer could say that anyway. And then you can have a, you can have an appeal hearing, okay. which I, we handle a lot, and that employer then gets cross-examined by somebody like me, and hopefully you've given me information that helps me expose that this is what's called a pretext. It's just an excuse to cover up. And the appeals, the referee, reverses the initial determination of essentially a clerk um, who, who heard magic words and said, okay, you're denied misconduct. So now you file your appeal and you get you get a telephone hearing. Um, those hearings are, can be brief and they can be lengthy, depending upon what's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But absent misconduct, a couple other things, if you're fired, you're entitled to unemployment. Um, I, I've, I've run across many cases where an employer, to be vindictive, will come up with something or say you quit. And if that clerk at that initial stage of the proceedings says, okay, I heard what I need to hear, you're denied. Well, then you just, it's a simple piece of paper. You can do it on your own. Very often people will come to an attorney at that point. And you file for an appeal. And a telephone hearing gets scheduled. You know, if you want documents to be submitted to evidence, you submit them ahead of time because it's a telephone hearing. Mm -hmm so that you can refer the referee to document one, and he has it, or she has it, in front of them. Now, is this, this is probably a long, drawn-out period, and I'm doing with no money, no, and I just no, go back to no. work. No, Unemployment okay. appeals hearings are very, very quick. Okay. They, they you know, a month, six weeks, 
they get the unemployment hearing scheduled very quickly, and the decision, you know, usually comes, it could come that day or within a week. I mean, there I've had appeals referees have the telephone hearing, and then by the end of the day, you know, we have an email with, with the order because they heard what they needed to hear. You know, they, they have a sort of a form that they follow for their opinions. You know, they have to cover certain bases and answer certain magic words. And so they, they plug them in, and there's their, there's their decision. You know, uh, the decision to grant unemployment is denied or approved. The decision to deny unemployment is approved or rejected. And you still have another appeal if you lose there. Now you can appeal to the circuit court. You can go into court, and that's a normal trial like any other trial. I haven't seen those in my career because I was gonna say, wouldn't it who's going to do that over two hundred seventy dollars? Exactly, at max a week? wouldn't it cost you more money to? Ch yeah, and you know, an attorney may handle it on a contingency fee if they truly believe you've really been wrong, mm -hmm. because the unemployment statute provides for attorney's fees. Okay. Now it doesn't provide that I can tell you I'm taking forty percent or I'm getting three hundred dollars an hour. I can sign. You can sign whatever contract you want with me. It is the appeals referee who gets to decide how much attorney's fees mm -hmm. are awarded. But then they would go back to the when you were first yes. dismissed from your job, and yes. you would get that back pay, yes. so you would get a percentage of that too, right? Well, no. It would have to be approved. Whatever my fee is would have to be approved by either the appeals referee, if it's in the administrative process, or by the court. Uh, unemployment is an area, just like disability and so, you know Social Security, where they determine what your fee mm -hmm, is. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have certain parameters, and trust me, the fee is usually nowhere near what you would have received either on a contingency basis or an hourly basis. You just have to be willing, you know, to handle that case and understand that, you know, it's not going to be a right. big money-making mm -hmm, case. Mm -hmm. you know? And there are attorneys that handle that, and, you know, sometimes if, you know, you, you've handled the appeals hearing and you really think that your client's been wronged, well, you'll take it to the circuit court knowing that you stand, you, you're likely to get your attorney's fees or some portion of them because you really believe your client's going to win. And if you're that confident, you go for it. Yeah, and I would think that that person would be to go that far. Well, certainly in, the in individual. trying to win that case. The individual certainly wouldn't. I, I can't imagine why they would object because they're not paying anything and. Might as well try yeah, it. But, you, but that person's probably not someone who quit who said that they were fired. Right. If you're going to go that far. Yes. It, it, it's, it has to be a really good case. And you also, you have the duty to mitigate your damages at all times. So you have the duty to continue to try to find work. Mm -hmm. And what will often happen is, okay, you find a good job, you take it, maybe you're even making more money than you were before. Now, do you just drop it? You know, you may have been entitled to two months, three months, four months, five months of your maybe max 270 a week. Some people really for that amount over a course of a few months will just say, I, I just I don't need it. I don't need to be in this process anymore. I'm happy I got this new job. Uh, I'm done. But then okay. how, but by not seeing that through, how does the attorney get paid? Doesn't. Mm. That's life. Those are the choices we make. And then there are some of those clients who will say, I want my back money. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I, it's, it's some, and I'm sure there's some people that go, I don't care if they give me a dollar. You and, always and hear you, that. And you get paid at this point. You know something? When, when <laughs> I, okay, when, we're, we're, we're deviating a little bit, but that's wonderful. When a prospective client calls our office or comes in for a consultation and they are aggressively trying to persuade me that they don't care if they only get a dollar or I can get my fees. This is a great case. Red flags go up. The red fireworks are firing. Warning, warning, warning signs are hitting my head. Let's be real. I do understand that there are issues that you will fight on principle. Absolutely. But for the most part, our civil justice system is about money. So if you don't care about the money, then you may have a malicious motive as to why you're doing this. 
I don't want to be part of <laughs> a malicious motive or a vendetta because mm -hmm. then when you get tired of it, it's over. And I, I really, I may have made nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I'm going to represent anybody on a contingency fee basis, I, I want them to care about the money. I want them to believe that they've been wronged and that the mechanism in our civil system to redress that wrong is money and they want to extract as much money as legitimately possible from that employer or company or whatever it, whatever situation it is. I'd much rather have that than somebody who says I don't really care about the money. Mm -hmm. uh, that, those are danger signs. And I will, I will concede it is occasionally true. And maybe even I can spot once or twice where it really is true. And those are okay. But for the most part, that just, that makes me worry. You know, so don't go tell your attorney that. <laughs> All right. So now, what's the next a, a good set of calls we go, Cheryl always has to listen to? Okay. I mean, she is being subjected to my voice now an hour. She has to listen. So what, what kind of calls does she, does she get and then I get and we all talk about regularly? Home you should bring Cheryl in one week you know something? as a guest. Cheryl, that was a wonderful idea. You know something? It's been a little over a year. Never even thought of it, honestly. Yeah. Maybe it's bring your paralegal to radio show day. There you go. And have her, <laughs> have her, have her tell all the truths that I don't want told. <laughs> Like the chocolate I eat in my office around <laughs> noon. Don't tell that, Cheryl. Come on. All right. Or, or the naps I sometimes take uh -oh. on the couch. <laughs> no. Come on. Uh, I, I think I, maybe I shouldn't bring her here. <laughs> she needs to catch the phones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but okay. So, we, homeowners, condo owners, mobile home associations. Oh, my goodness Well, we gracious. have a lot of those in this area. Absolutely. So, yeah, I would see that, yeah. You know, it doesn't even matter which type of association. I mean, each one has a separate statute, okay? Um, and some of them have slightly different provisions. But essentially, homeowner, condo, mobile home, uh, you hear the same thing. Um, the association is threatening me or has uh, put a lien on or it sent me a violation notice because my grass was a quarter of an inch too high. What can I do? Or I have a neighbor that is the community yenta, and all she does is go around and look for things to complain about so people get violation notices. What can I do? Well, okay. If they're wrong, you can challenge it. If they're right, solve the problem, honestly. I mean, I don't want to live in an association for just that reason. Uh, mm -hmm. If my grass is a quarter of an inch too high, and, okay, they let's say they've warned me two or three times, and you know, I just think, it's a quarter of an inch, who the hell cares? I said heck there. You might even like it that way, right. a little longer. But then all of a sudden I'm getting fined. mow the grass <laughs> don't let the fines add up don't let them put a lien on it's not worth it put it in gravel yeah you know, I, know, I know it's <laughs> lovely to fight for the principal but i'll tell you what you do in those situations i have a client doing it right now and very effectively vote the bums out and if the election is 11 months from now do a recall petition to get rid of the director or directors that may have a vendetta. But see, it's always the folks who have time on their hands that are, the, and the people who go to work. It, it's the, the certain residents who can be yes. on the board. Well, no, anybody can be on the board. It's those people who have time to go around the neighborhood and find all the violations. Yeah. Well, they're on the board so they could do something about it. You no. Know. <laughs> but we have, I have a client right now who next week they have a recall petition. Uh, they know they're going to be voting the president out. They may be voting a couple of uh, a recall petitions. Mm -hmm. so it's not even a – they're voting them out, but it's not a normal election. And they're going to replace them with people that 
aren't going to issue violations for the particular issues that are happening right there, that we'll look at it in a different way. I, that's the political process. When you move into an association, you are accepting a political process. And sometimes that means going to court to fight it, but that's expensive. Um, it, 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 if you're wrong, you know, if you're keeping a pet chimpanzee. You're wrong. And you're not allowed. <laughs> yeah. But you love that chimpanzee. Mm, you need to move. Then either move or get rid of the chimpanzee. <laughs> you need to move. Uh, the, you know, honestly, there's probably nothing I can do to help you. Yeah. But it's where somebody on the board or on the architectural review commission or, or whatever subcommittee they have has some personal animus against you. And all of a sudden you find that you're being cited for things that nobody else is being cited for. Now, yes, it's a violation. And yes, you, you, you're technically guilty, let's say. You planted a shrub. And you're not allowed to plant a shrub without the a permission yeah. of the Architectural Review Committee. Okay. But if all your neighbors have planted shrubs and nobody cares, then you're being singled out. And under the statute, while the board has the authority to issue fines, to place liens, no selective enforcement. You apply the rules and regulations equally and fairly, or you don't apply them at all. So if you're not allowed to bring your own towels to the pool, then either everybody who brings the towels had better be cited or nobody had better be cited. Mm -hmm. Not just the person that you live next door to that plays loud music and so they are angry at you. And this is the way they're going to get you. you know, that doesn't cut it. So when we get these calls, you know, my, my HOA is treating me unfairly. My HOA won't let me do X. Same, we, we, we all have the same response. Okay. We need to see the Declaration of Covenants. We need to see the bylaws. We need to see the rules and regulations. With those three sets of documents, we can probably hear what you have to say and assess whether you do have the right to do what you want to do. And if you're being resisted for some reason... You know, maybe we can, short of litigation, send a politely and sometimes not so politely worded letter to the board and let them know that you know, they may want to show it to their attorney, they all have them, and, and decide whether it's worth litigation over this. And I have found oftentimes my clients are, saying, okay, you can do what you're going to do. And that's, it, you know, it, it's, it's an easy way to solve it. Or we'll get the call... The HOA has threatened me or has actually issued an assessment or has placed the lien. Now, how do you get to that point? How do you get to the place the lien point? All right. If they have assessed you and fined you, you don't pay the fine within the appropriate time. They have the right to lien your property. So you go to sell, you now have to pay the lien, plus attorney's fees and costs and all that baloney. Um, otherwise, you can't sell your property. Mm -hmm. So if you believe the lien is unfair, you need to have that lien removed. The only way to remove the lien is either through a settlement or through a court case to force the lien to be removed. Those are, those are things that are dangerous. Now, you got a lien, they have an attorney. Yeah. The lien might have been for $100. Now the attorney wants 3000 This is what happens. And... Even getting people out under the best of circumstances means they're paying money that they shouldn't mm -hmm. have had to pay, and then they paid me, and, you know, that's... You would think people would know going in that these are the rules and these are the things that are going to happen if you don't do those things. Well, okay, so when people do them wrong, I agree with you. But despite rules, every, every grouping of people have understandings that aren't written. Understandings that these rules, certain rules are not going to be enforced. The police don't enforce well, certain things. Yeah, no, they can't. They There's choose, not enough of them. Right, and they choose which things are more important. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So there's an understanding that if I'm going 75 on the turnpike, the chances of one of those cops choosing to pull me over is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. 79? Probably not. 80? Maybe. Second I get above 14 miles an hour above the speed limit, where the law changes, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. they're going to come yeah. after you. Yeah, because, well, yeah, more money. <laughs> now, I'm going two miles an hour the speed limit, and he pulls me over and gives me a ticket. I'm probably going to lose. Because there is no rule there against selective enforcement. I can't say, how come you let all those cars go? Can't do that. Though. Yeah, because they caught you today. Right. They'll catch them but another day. But in, yeah. in so homeowners associations, that rule does exist. So you may go into a community, and you've been there for years. And there's an understanding that if the bush in front of the house dies, and they're not taking care of it fast enough, and, and you just want to replace it, pull the dang bush, put your new bush in from Home Depot, no harm, no foul. And now all of a sudden you get a citation, remove the bush. It's the same bush they were going to put in, but they didn't put it in, so remove it, and we will get to it when we get to it. Now that seems ridiculous. But that's human nature, though. That's like, um, you know, we're, that's our job. We're supposed to do that. You're not supposed to. I know. You know, but if there's an we're in charge. If there's an understanding that something like that is okay, and now you're cited, now you can say, well, what about all these people who replace bushes? That's a legitimate defense. So we're always looking for those things, you know, especially if, the, if it's gotten so far that the association has now said, we're going to go foreclose on our lien. In other words, they haven't just placed the lien, but they're, now they're filing a suit to take your home. They're entitled, they're entitled to foreclose just like the bank's entitled to foreclose. <laughs> you better be fighting that. What if you own it outright and there's nowhere to go? I mean, how do you... Cause they if would you have own to it outright, they could still place a, 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 a fine uh, you, a place a lien, okay. and foreclose on the lien. Your, your mortgage company can't do anything because you own it outright, but the association can. They're given the statutory authority to place liens. So they would make you sell your unit? or Either they, that or pay the money, <laughs> plus the attorney's fees, to remove the lien. It, 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 it's, it's, yeah. I would think if you got to that point, you're living in a hostile neighborhood. You know, you know so many times I've said that to people. Now, I understand you're living somewhere 10, 12, 15 years. But the board changes. Yeah, you don't want to move. But if you're you generally it. in a neighborhood where you're being harassed, it may be time to consider getting out. And I know that's easier said than done. Yeah. I, selling a home, buying a home, moving especially if you have kids in school. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's worth it just to fight. Because sometimes if you fight, they'll never touch you again. Because mm -hmm. they know you're going to fight back. And so now, you're okay. Mm -hmm. You're gold. Mm -hmm. And your neighbors are gold too because they know you. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, just go find another place. I, I've had clients sell and move and it's not a victory for the homeowners well, association yeah. it's not it's a victory for you in, in, in getting to a, a place that you're going to be happier in but if if you are insistent on remaining in the community if your parents live on the street next door you know one 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 row over if your sister lives three blocks down Okay, you, you may want to fight this. And it almost feels like it's become like a clique against you. Like there's a, you know, the, the group has ganged up on you for something that they think you should be doing different. It usually is that way. You know, when there are legitimate reasons to cite somebody, fix it. I mm -hmm. mean, it's like code yeah. enforcement. Yeah. If code enforcement comes by and says, your grass is up to four feet, you need to mow it. Or you can't keep that sofa on the front porch. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know something? Do what you're told to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the fines are going to grow, and you're going to have consequences pursuant to the statute that allows code enforcement to come out and do these things. 
you know, you go in front of the code enforcement magistrate, and you know, then if you don't like it, then go up to circuit court, and you know, if you want to spend forty thousand dollars to keep that couch on your front porch, you know, go. If you come into me and you tell me I won the lottery and I don't care how much money I pay, I want that couch on my front porch <laughs> for as long as possible. I will fight the good fight for you. But I will tell you it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You want to pay me, you know, that's your choice. I'll try to be honest with you. I'm sure here in Florida there's a lot of, like, homeowners, like, because people have boats, people mm -hmm. have pickup trucks that they don't, associations don't like. Right. Um, you're not driving a van in there. Well, even in my neighborhood, <laughs> which is not an association, there was a couple streets over um, somebody who had a very, very, very large, long RV. Okay. That they parked on the street because it was not really convenient to park it on the driveway. Can't do that. Right. One day, code enforcement came by, saw the RV, issued a citation. Well, I think for, actually, I think first they do a warning. If you don't comply with the warning, then you get a citation. So, you know, maybe these folks reacted to the warning. Next thing you know is they're trying to figure out how to get the RV onto the driveway without it hanging over. So they have to put it on blocks and remove the front part or whatever it is. And that's their way of doing it. Now, it, does make, it doesn't make it convenient to use it every yeah, weekend. I like when they slide it between the two houses, <laughs> and then I guess both neighbors get to enjoy the view right, of yes. the RV between the yes. houses. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it, it's either do that or, or, you know, or pay the piper. Mm -hmm. um, boy, it's amazing how little we can cover when we talk a lot or I talk a lot. <laughs> All right, so we, we're down to about two minutes. And um, let me just say that we get a lot of different types of phone calls in the office because we do general civil litigation. You know, we do a lot of employment law, discrimination, civil rights, but we do most other types of civil litigation as well. Uh, the reality is most people that call us don't really have a case. It's not like calling a personal injury attorney. You've been in an accident. You've broken a shoulder. So you have a case. It may not be a, a big dollar case, mm -hmm. but you have a case. You call that personal injury lawyer, they should be able to sign you up. You call us, we're dealing with a lot of different areas of the law. You may think you have a case. You may need to know whether you have a case. Um, you may need to know what, how good of a case it is. And that's what we try to do. And if we don't think there's a case, we're going to tell you. And we're going to tell you, check with another lawyer because don't just rely on me. Don't rely on one piece of advice. Never. Always try to get at least a second opinion. And we try to be straight with people. And it's the way I do things. It's uh, the, what, what I believe. And, you know, that's about it for the week. We will, we will see you next week, next Friday, for Ask a Lawyer. Give us a call at the office at 781-8003. And uh, thanks for listening, and have a wonderful weekend.